Hello everyone, TLSG here, back again with another Daily Marvel Snap video. So today we have a take on a Devil Dino build, a Moon Girl build, a Zabu build that is one, incredibly accessible, and two, incredibly, incredibly consistent. So I feel like with a lot of deck lists these days, it is very intricate. There are a lot of cool play lines, but if those play lines don't pan out, how do you still put value onto the board? And so that's what this list wants to do is with every turn, it wants to fight for tempo. It wants to fight for value. It, it wants to position you in a way that if for any reason the game ends right then, that you are in a really good spot to still win. And so it does have a couple of counter cards in our Shang-Chi and Enchantress. Those are there to help with the consistency. Any kind of greedy play lines that your opponent pushes. So that Hawk that is expensive that almost nobody has. The big Shuri play follow up. You're going to be able to take those plays and flip them on their head. And if not, you have some incredible value in your White Queen, your Crossbones and your Devil Dino. And it gets even better if you're able to duplicate those and flood several onto the board with your Zabu. And so overall, the deck list is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward, but it is incredibly efficient. It reminds me a lot of a Sarah control style deck, but better. This not only has the capability of countering your opponent's play, but you can push some really strong plays yourself. And so then if they don't get a good draw, you know that your raw value is going to outpower theirs. And then if they do, you can counter it with your counter cards and it just performs really, really well. With this list, even though it only has, what, one Series 3 card in the Crossbones, I've been able to perform incredibly well, just under a 60% win rate, with around a 6.5 cubes gained per game, which is phenomenal, and especially for this being an accessible list as long as you have the Season Pass. Now, if you don't have Crossbones, I would replace him for another really strong 4-cost card, something that has a lot of base power, because you're going to want to flood multiple onto the board, something that is just really strong, that doesn't need two turns to set up, so not a Rescue or a Jessica Jones. I would think more along the lines of a Drax, of a Rock Slide, of maybe even Omega Red, because then if you double down on it, there's a chance that you can trigger it and push power into other lanes. But I think all of those would do phenomenally today. You could do a Spider-Man, but a lot of times Spider-Man is going to lock the opponent out of any chance of winning. And so then you mitigate your cube gains because you're not going to see that game all the way through to the end of turn six. And so overall, very straightforward deck list. Let's go ahead and jump over into a couple of games. I'll show you how I navigate it. All right, so first up we have GR2. The first location is Atlantis. And so we're going to be able to play maybe one card, but most likely we're going to flood multiple. It is a good target lane for something like a Shang-Chi, because if the opponent just drops one card, quite often it is going to be above that Shang-Chi range, so above nine power or at or above nine power. The second location is Gamma Lab, which is another great target for our Shang-Chi. We don't have anything that we're going to flood into that location unless we get Project Pegasus then we might consider it. We want Zabu just onto the board. That way he reduces the cost of our four cost cards on the following turns. We do have White Queen. That is going to give us some insight into what their highest cost card is. And it's going to turn into a Hulk, which is okay. Um, with them going so heavy into the Gamma Lab, what we're going to need, wow. And then they pull an Infinite. So it's actually a downgrade for them on that one. And so if we pull into our Shang-Chi, that is going to be our ideal play. Shang-Chi is going to wipe out this lane and just win us the game in this situation. Sometimes Shang-Chi is not going to be great. A lot of times Enchantress isn't going to be great either. But when they are good, they are very good. I'm going to go ahead and play Crossbones. I think we just tempo drop an Enchantress. It's not going to impact anything in this lane. But based off the cards that they did play, I don't think they're going to have any kind of ongoing abilities that we're going to need to cancel out. And so, especially with it being towards the very end of the game, we also didn't want to Moon Girl because we really want the chance to draw into our Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi is going to be phenomenal for us. And then if we don't draw into it, we can always double down with Moon Girl next turn. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to lean into the Devil Dino in Atlantis. And then we are going to see what we top deck next. So they have the Omega Red. So this looks like the list that we featured yesterday, uh, Din's list. And so we do top deck into the Shang-Chi, which is beautiful that means that we're going to be able to do the shang chi we can wipe out this lane we keep our hulk unless they have a shang chi of their own and if they do then that's only three power in this lane we have seven and then we ha just have to make sure that they don't win the project pegasus lane by more than 10. and so i'm in a situation where i would snap i am confident enough that we would snap we're going to reload our hand just a little bit with the moon girl Devil Dino is going to be reduced in power just a touch but i think that's going to allow us to win the gamma lab in the project pegasus lane pretty easily. So they do just play one card here. Very interesting. I'm curious uh, what they are running. Maybe it's the Shang-Chi and Atlantis. That way they have just that remaining. 
No, it's a Magneto. So they pull some of our cards over. They, ooh, they pull our crossbones. Wow, they pull a lot of our stuff. Um, but because of that, I think even if they get the great pull in the Project Pegasus lane, we're able to win the other two. And we are able to find our win condition. Nothing flashy, nothing crazy, just value across the board. That way, no matter what the opponent throws at us or what the game's RNG throws at us, we can react. All right, next up we have Paz. The first location is Washington, D.C. We are going to skip on one. We do have either our Lizard to help us grab uh, initiative, or we have our Scorpion that's going to impact all of their cards. Especially since they didn't play a card on turn one, we're going to go ahead and play our Scorpion. That is going to give us uh, the five value from their hand plus the two, so it's a seven power two cost play. That's how I like to look at it, is how much value is it offering across the board. And it could potentially be even more if they were planning on doing uh, an Iron Man or if they were planning to double down on those cards with their Moon Girl, then all of a sudden that impact can be greater than seven as well. So we're gonna go ahead and play our Zabu into Central Park. That will allow us to start hiding some of our cards into the Dark Dimension. Uh, ooh, they play a Brood, which is a pretty big one, but can we But can we beat it? So I think we double down on our Dino, on our Crossbones and on our Armor. Uh, two Devil Dinos are 17 power each, which are huge, huge resources. Uh, the crossbones being eight power for two cost is also huge it does look like a silver surfer list so if they trigger it once that's going to be three six nine extra power here so it would be 22 power we can we have a chance at beating that with something like a devil dino and that's if they are going with the mid path of only pushing it one time here now if they have the wong things get a little bit dicier i think we're going to lean into the double devil dino um i don't think they're going to see it coming we do have zabu so i think they or probably, ooh, so the Sarah, they could flood uh, several cards onto the board. They could now do a Silver Surfer and an Absorbing Man, a Wong and a Silver Surfer, um, but that's if they invest that heavily there. And so since we know that we beat the single trigger, I'm going to go ahead and stick this one out. We're going to lock in the second Devil Dino and then see how, how high their high roll is. So they do push more power into the Central Park lane. That's not where we're pushing for. They have the Silver Surfer. If they also have something like a Ironheart, they could have competed for it. Uh, but even with the Silver Surfer trigger on the Brood in Washington, D.C., just the raw power and the raw value of our Double Devil Dino is enough to let us find the win. All right, next up we have Sorian. Uh, they do play a Hawkeye, which is going to trigger twice in Kamartage. Really, the only time I see Hawkeye is whenever they're wanting to maybe sneak out and add a Morlock uh, early. That way they can start drawing into cards. So we're going to invest some some power over here. Scorpion is going to trigger twice, and so that's going to negatively impact their hand two times. And so it is the Adam Warlock. That's so strange that based off of just one card, uh, we were able to read that Adam Warlock was likely in their deck. And so they are going to draw into some additional cards. I am curious what their reasoning for the Adam Warlock is. So it could be that they're running a control style deck, something that wants to run a Valkyrie at the end of the game to set our cards to three and then they'll have some way to buff them up further. Um, now, if that's the case, we might be able to we might be able to hold our own. So our White Queen is going to pull into two resources for us here because Kamartage is going to allow it to trigger twice. And I'm actually going to play our Sunspot there as well. And so we'll get so we'll have five cards in our hand. We don't necessarily need to force the Moon Girl just yet. Maybe if we want to make sure that we're capped out at the end of the game, we do. But otherwise, we are going to... Ooh, so the Cosmo comes down, which stops our White Queen, which is unfortunate. But we are going to be able to find a way to push more power than they have into that location. Um, and then it comes down to a Battle of the Sunspots. And so we're going to go ahead and throw Enchantress over there. We have the Moon Girl, which will help us reload our hand. Um, and then we can really try to figure out what the reasoning for pushing that much power is. They could be going with a Galactus deck. This could be something that is running Galactus and wants to guarantee that they have it in their hand, but they have a Professor X instead. So it does look like that control style aspect. So the question becomes, if this is a Valkyrie deck, can they flood enough cards onto the board to offset our full board here? Or do they just skip and absorb all of their energy with their Sunspot? It's a really tricky position to be in because they can be at max 18. And so because of that, I think we're actually going to just play the Crossbones. It depends. We're going to play just the Crossbones, see what they end up playing. They play one card, they play the Destroyer, so we should have played both. Oh, no. Oh, but Scorpion actually allows us, since it hit Destroyer twice, it allows us to still find our win. I thought we had lost that one. Scorpion came in absolutely clutch. It would have been 15, 
Even if it had only triggered once, it would force the tie in Kunlun. So we almost made the wrong call, but it turns out it was right. Let's go ahead and jump over into the next one. All right, next up we have Varix. And the first location is Kamartage. We have our Iceman and our Scorpion, which is beautiful. That is going to disrupt their play line so drastically. Um, so if they had a really heavy hand, that makes a Red Skull 6. That could potentially make a Shuri 6. Um, just really unfortunate for them. We are going to go ahead and play our Scorpion. That is going to double trigger as well. And honestly, that and honestly that might be enough for me to, to call it a game. Um, if I was them and I was facing that, that might be enough to, to, to force me to go away. So Shuri's Lab does come down as the last location. And so playing things like our White Queen there will be really, really strong. They'll be really strong plays. I think we're going to lean into the armor to the left. We can do a White Queen, start stacking some power over there. Ooh, they actually allow us to draw into some additional cards with their Maximus, which is actually kind of great. We can then do the Zabu. We can do a Sunspot and allow him to start absorbing some energy. Next turn, we could lean in with a White Queen or a Moon Girl. In the Domino into the Maximus, tells me it is probably a Silver Surfer deck. They're probably going to have a Brood. Dropping a Silver Surfer in Kamartage is massive. What a cool variant for Groot. I haven't seen that one, so I don't know if it's new or just uh, just really snazzy, but it is really, really cool to see. And so I think we're going to do the Shang-Chi to take out their Maximus. We can then do a Moon Girl, which is going to bring us to a max hand size. That will allow us to choose between doing a, a couple of White Queens, uh, a Lizard and a couple of White Queens, or leaning more towards the large Devil Dino that we have. They do use a Killmonger. It destroys our Sunspot. It can't destroy the Iceman. Um, but that is still in line with the Silver Surfer. So I can only assume that they're going to do a Brood here, and then the Silver Surfer come down in Kamar Taj. That would trigger plus three to all three cost twice, and so that would be a really big lane here. And so if that is how they go, and they do the Brood and the Silver Surfer, then that would be six extra power here, and they do end up retreating, but we were going to angle for doing the White Queen and Lizard in Shuri's Lab, just in case they did something like a Wolfsbane, and then the Silver Surfer trying to push this lane, and then we were going to do our last resource, in the Vibranium Mines, just in case they didn't play anything there. All right, next up we have Hoinher. Hoin the first location is Titan, which we don't have any six cost cards, um, so we're not going to get any benefit from that. We are going to go ahead and throw our Sunspot and our Armor onto the board, and then if we need to start skipping to absorb some energy, we can. Nova Roma allows us to draw into our Shang-Chi. We also get our Moon Girl, so if we do happen to top deck into Zabu by chance, then we will have a lot of cards that we're able to flood, we can double down on them, and then we just have a lot of utility and a lot of resources. And so we don't draw on the Zabu, but we do get Devil Dino. And so to continue pushing for tempo, continue pushing for advantage, we're going to play Lizard into Xandar. Since they played Bast, the most common shell for Bast is a Silver Surfer or a negative Silver Surfer decklist. And so we have to anticipate that that's potentially coming, but then the Deathlock is not standard. Um, so maybe it's a maybe it's a Bast Galactus negative. I, I don't know. I don't know. I we are in uncharted waters. I don't even know how to begin to guess at what this deck is. I'm gonna go ahead and play our Moon Girl into Xandar. That will give us an additional Devil Dino. And so then we could play one on five and on six. Um, they do a Beast into a Carnage. This has to be, what? This has to be like a Galactus or a Null or a negative Null or something like that, right? We're gonna go ahead and play Devil Dino into, the first Devil Dino into Titan. And then we're gonna look to see what they're playing. And so alongside the Deathlock and the Carnage, they throw down Magic. So could be a Null into an Arnhem Zola maybe? And so if that's the case, we have our Enchantress and our Shang-Chi at the ready to destroy it, but we can only play one of those two. So I'm going to go ahead and play Devil Dino into Xandar, and then I anticipate, well, they couldn't do Null here. And so whatever it ended up being, because of our armor, that makes it tough for them to do an Arnhem Zola play. Maybe they do a Venom into an Arnhem Zola? I don't know. We're still in Uncharted Waters. So they do play two cards on turn six. In The first one is the hood and the second one is the null and so if they do have an arnhem zola that's not going to be enough once it destroys this nine that becomes an 18 power null which is over here and we do have initiative so i'm going to go ahead and use our enchantress into xandar even if they use an enchantress of their own for some reason to counteract this one oh no we're not going to do, do enchantress we're going to do shang chi instead enchantress would have wiped out our devil dino that would have been real bad we're going to do shang chi to take out their null before they can do anything with it and just very interesting. I 
did want to play something like this, like a negative null deck, um, but I just wasn't able to make it work consistently. It is interesting to see it. The Arnold Mazzola was the play line that they were trying to hit the Null with, but it hits the Carnage instead. So it does wipe out their Limbo lane. As long as we have enough power in Titan, then we are okay. So the Deadpool, the Demon, the Carnage comes down and it is not quite enough. So I always really like to be surprised by a deck. I've seen so many different variations and different ideas, but to be able to find one that is consistent, that is just unique, is so satisfying. And so I hope that they continue to tweak this deck and find a way to make it work. Because one, a negative null deck would be so much fun. But with that one, we are going to go ahead and end the video. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave it a like and a comment down below. As always, this has been TLSG. Later, guys.